Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. My name is Jane Applegath, a former award-winning stockbroker, television producer, script, ri script writer, yoga instructor, and serial entrepreneur, now founder of the Epic Vision Zone. I'm here to help you fulfill your dreams, big vision, grow the power of your voice, and achieve the impact you're meant to have on the world because what you say and how you say it is the key to influencing more people, growing financially free and living a more abundant and joyful life. Here at the Epic Vision Zone, we bring you some of the world's most influential people to inspire you to hit the go button on your epic life. A big thank you to everyone for being here today. Matthew Jacobson wrote, Behind every young child who believes in himself or herself is a parent who believed first. Julie Phillips Hatch has a passion for helping children. A mom, a parenting expert, holistic health and pediatri pediatric nurse practitioner. She is a traditional Western medicine practitioner turned alternative holistic specialist. After years working in pediatric intensive care, then in neonatal intensive care, Julie's focus shifted to the realm of Eastern medicine and holistic health. She attained a master's degree in traditional Chinese medicine, encompassing acupuncture, herbal medicine, and mind-body spirit practices. In conjunction to a thriving holistic health care and acupuncture practice, Julie coaches parents on alternative methods of parenting that honor a child's inner spirit and nature. For years, she started her parent counseling business, Moms on a Mission, Consciously Connecting with Your Kids. Her mission is to help kids find the emotional, mental, and physical health they all deserve. And that, she says, starts with the parents. She is also host the parenting podcast called Julie Hatch, Moms on a Mission. Today, Julie is here to talk about her new Amazon number one best-selling book, A Parenting Revolution for Higher Evolution, Raising Resilient, Responsible, Compassionate Kids from the Inside Out. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Jane. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, I am, I was speaking just briefly with Julie earlier and there could not be a better time for this subject. I am so excited to delve into it. So give us a little insight into authoring your book. What was the inspiration for this book? The inspiration came from two, two places probably. One is that I want to um, explain the wisdom of Chinese medicine and specifically the five elements and how that pertains to um, children and health in general, but also seeing and hearing a lot of anxiety in kids these days and depression in kids these days and reading about the rates going up, up, up. And I started the book before the pandemic. So it's just, and it's just gotten worse. So um, those two, there's a, there's a problem with our kids' mental and emotional health, I think. And I believe that there are many components to Chinese medicine that can help parents help their kids. Yes, I, I can certainly see. And it's interesting that you say you started the book before the pandemic. So that might have been a little bit of divine timing there. Um, <laughs> because who knew, right, at that time? And you're right, the young children today, you know, I have a niece who is now 18 but um, she has a friend who has terrible anxiety. Now she's not a little one, obviously, but still I'm like, you know, when I was that age, I never had anxiety. I never even really knew what it was. And so this is a very, um, uh, a, a very hot topic right now. And I think in the future, so name the common mistakes that parents make in raising their kids that influence children to becoming insecure fearful, maybe unhappy, and irresponsible and unable to function with compassion. Okay, I'll start with the long list. <laughs> I'll try to oh, figure goodness. out where to start and stop. <laughs> 
but um, I would say first and foremost is that we as parents set the example. And so any behaviors um, that we have, any anxiety that we carry around, the way that we respond to stress in our lives, the way that we, everything that we say, that we do, things that we don't say, the unspoken communication, pick, kids pick up on it and we are their, their models. They do not know how to be when they're young. They don't know how to be in life except for what they see right around them. And that's usually the parents, number one, foremost. So by modeling, or at least setting a good example, trying to um, fix your own anxieties um, and not pass them along to your kids, that's a start. I also think that parents um, pressure their kids a lot. As kids get older and older, they pressure them into being a certain way, acting a certain way, achieving certain things that the parent thinks is is what the parent wants and what the parent expects of them, which can be okay to a certain extent, but it's but it is not um, honoring what the child's desires are and what the child should be um, doing or achieving in their own right, in their own way. So parents can try to trying to be push, push, push them, and I think there's a lot of pressure on kids these days, and um, I, I think that that's also producing a lot of anxiety. Yes, I could see that because the elements today are not just the parents, but the outer world, which is the social media. Um, and so they have double duty almost in the sense that, you know, they get pressure from or, you know, they'll feel feel or anxiety from maybe their classroom or whatever they're they're looking at or feeling. And then, of course, you've got the home environment. So we're almost like the radar you know, the parent becomes mm -hmm. the radar and the child picks up on that because like you know, and I know the energy is, is very um, contagious and it goes out there. So that's, that's really insightful. Um, I appreciate that information because what we have to do as parents is probably become more aware of how we're behaving. Um, Cause like you said, children pick up on everything. And which leads me into the next question. You said your book focuses on raising children from the inside out. I love that expression, but unpack that for our audience. So from the inside out is a term that Chinese medicine uses that when you treat somebody with acupuncture or herbs or in the Chinese fashion, you are treating the inside because the inside is the root of the problem when you're talking about physical health problems. You're getting to the root of the problem and then all the symptoms and everything on the outside naturally follow and, and go away. They're, they're healed if you heal from the inside. So with children, and when you're talking about kids that are, which, is, which does happen is that the kids are, are um, creating their self-image and their self-worth from the outer elements, from what other people are saying. Mm. What I really believe and what my book talks about is that if we can get a child to really understand themselves, if we can understand our children at the very deep core level and help our kids to understand and love themselves from the deep core who they are, not who everybody else is telling them that they should be or might be or might not be, but who they are, which starts at a, as early as you possibly can, that is what, um, that is what builds confidence and self-worth and resilience and all the good stuff is that it needs to come from within. And so it's our job to, I, I think it's our job as parents to see that inner child, who they are on the inner, on the, and at the core, their inner essence, their true nature. I call it all different kinds of things in the book and then honor that and nourish it and respect it and, because that's who the child is. And if they know, if they feel solid and confident, really good about who they are on the inside, all of the stuff on the outside, all the negativity is going to have less, I hope, of an impact on them. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm really curious as how you would get a child or find that inside out, but we'll, we'll move on because I'm sure it explains it a little deeper here. You have a phrase that you call holistic parenting. Um, what exactly is that? Holistic parenting, well, so holistic health is mind, body, and spirit, you know, encompassing all for optimal health. And so um, holistic parenting is in seeing the child, who they are for their mind, their body, and their spirit. 
most so their spirit and then parenting to all three components not just not just their academics not just their sporting abilities not just their you know problematic traits of their personality but the whole child and and treating the whole parenting the whole child just like as an acupuncturist you treat the whole patient not just their one symptom so that's holistic parenting broadly and then specifically it's getting into like we have mentioned a little bit about um parenting to who they who they are on the at the core and and nourishing who they are from the from the inner from the inside and yet and when you nourish them from the inside the outside just naturally flourishes and that's that's holistic parenting in 101 <laughs> right well, I know there's there's a lot more layers to that, but you're right. Taking the whole, the mind, body, and spirit, you know, um, which is uh, a healthier way to approach life in general. You know, as we we're learning more from the ancients as opposed to the West, because now our science can prove that all of that was is is very um, wellness is is very much at the top of individuals and and our well being is something that. I think that the ancients knew quite well, um, but now because science can prove it, the Western medicine is like, okay, we get it now. <laughs> it takes us a little yep, longer, very, but but certainly true, makes exactly. sense, right? Yeah. So yeah. what made you decide to tackle this approach to parenting? Because it's not like you, you know, you you have your your degrees in nursing and and all the others. So this is this is very interesting. What made you decide to go into this? Again, from from Chinese medicine all through acupuncture school and, and Chinese medical schools, what they call it, it just makes so much sense. And again, the uh, or in my book and the foundation of what I teach talk to parents about is the five elements. And it just and and the like you say the wisdom from thousands of years old from the of the Chinese medicine. It's so rich with just information and guidance and just insights. And so the five elements, um, I was trying to figure out how I could bring that into my acupuncture practice with kids. And it just makes so much sense that it's just, it's just really logical and it's a pretty easy <laughs> way of parenting when you can apply the five elements rather than trying to um, figure out what you should be doing because you, know, you can uh, try to figure out what you're trying to do with your child's problematic behavior. You can Google it. You can talk to your mother, your mother-in-law, your best friend. Um, but the five elements is a really good um, place to start in guiding you. Right. Well, speaking of the five elements, in fact, um, that's a great segue to our next question, because how do you, do you recognize the five elements? To maybe just explain to us what they are a little bit and uh, how they work, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yeah, so the five elements, um, that is the Chinese medicine um, terminology, is, I also call it, it's a way to find um, your child's inner essence, or their soul, or their true nature, which is, um, in essence, what drives them, um, what motivates them, it is what makes, who the, makes them, it's what makes them who they are, um, it's their personality, it's their temperament, it is, it is just who they are at the core. So the five elements, you can take a quiz in the um, back of the book or on my website. And essentially the five elements are wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And everybody, all children and everybody falls under one of these. And if you take the quiz, you list, list a whole bunch of um, typical traits and characteristics about each one. And whichever you get the highest score on is the is the dominant element type sometimes there is a close second and that's a supporting element type but there's always one dominant element type and we are born with those element types and we will die with those uh, that element type they don't it doesn't change that is your element type for for life so mm. um real quickly if you'd like me to go through them which is what the characteristics overall characteristics are and again, the, the reason this is helpful is because it, it will tell you what motivates your child and what challenges and stresses your child. So the stuff that motivates your child, you want to feed into that and offer them more of that. And you, want, and you know that that's a direction that they will thrive in and things that 
challenge them um, or stress them or things that you want to be aw very aware of and perhaps avoid or teach them how to contend with. So wood, I'll start with wood, and that is um, the element of spring where things are coming up out of the ground and blooming and growing and pushing up and out and forward. So wood children are super energetic. They are very energetic. They can be really loud and boisterous. They are competitive. They like to win. They like to come in first. It's really important to them. Many um, ADHD children are considered wood children. And this is another benefit to the five elements. I don't believe in labeling children, saying, oh, this is my ADHD child. It's not helpful mm. to that child. It's more helpful to say this is my wood child, which means that he's highly energetic and he needs to move all the time and he's competitive and he's loud and he's go, 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 <laughs> is, what the, is what the wood child is. And that's a yang type, which is up and out and bright. And the other yang element type is fire. And fire children are also energetic, not quite as hyperly so, but they're very energetic. They're very charismatic. They are funny. Um, they like to perform and they like to entertain people. And people really like fire. They are, they're drawn to fire children because they're so charismatic. Um, they know how to speak with, well, they, you know, they know how to speak and carry on a conversation with somebody and they love interacting with people. They also like the bright, shiny objects. So they can have a little bit of attention deficit because they, you know, they like that. They want to do that. They want to do that. They want to do that. And it's hard for them to focus on one particular task at hand. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit if that's okay. So the wood, their stressors are being told to sit still and pay attention for an hour in mm -hmm. the classroom. They're going to have a hard time doing that. And so it's beneficial yep. to be aware and see if things can be accommodated for that. Their challenges are so, and then people often will, will punish a, a wood child by making them stay inside and sit, you know, as a punishment, stay inside and sit. When in fact, what child, what's, what is motivating for them is being able to get out and run around and, and move. So it's good to know what motivates them and what, what stresses them. Fire children, um, what motivates them is being the center of attention. They like to act, they like to be on display, they like to be the, the center of attention. Um, and what stresses, and they also like the new, the new environments, the new activities, something always new and different coming along. So what stresses them is boredom, not having enough novelty in their, in their environment and not getting um, the right amount and kind of attention, which doesn't mean that you need to always be fawning all over them. It's not that kind of attention. They just need to know that you're listening to them. You're going to laugh at their joke and then they go off and do their thing. Um, so then there is the earth element, which is neither yin or yang. They're sort of, in, it's kind of in the middle and the earth element type kids are peacemakers. They are diplomats. They are really easygoing. They're little Buddha babies who are just, they love to have people around. They smile. They're easygoing. They do not like to make waves. they people also really like them because they're so easy. Um, and again, they love their friends. They love their family, their caretakers. They're loving children. They love to sit in your lap and, and caress and cuddle with you. They like being around a lot of people. They do not like being the center of attention, but they like to be on the outskirts and have and have see what's going on with the people around them. So what motivates them obviously is being around people, um, having the security of their family or, or friends around. And what stresses them is, is um, be, being alone and mm -hmm. not not having their family around or not knowing where their family is or wondering when you know when people are going to be coming home right. they need their they need the security of their family metal children are um so this is getting into more yin so metal goes along with early winter and or late fall early winter and it is they're they're rigid they're kind of rigid they like the rules they like to follow a schedule they like predictability they like to know what the schedule is going to be. Um, like I say, they like to know what the rules are. They are, um, they like justice. They are called the true judge and they like justice. They like to know that they're doing the right thing and that their friend better be doing the right thing too. So they're very aware of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. They don't need a whole lot of discipline because they know right and wrong. They don't like to be punished. They don't like to be yelled at or humiliated. That That is such a big stressor for them if they get embarrassed by somebody yelling at them and 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 reprimanding them in public. It's terrible stress for, 
stress for any child, but for a metal child, it's really very, very stressful. Um, but they love predictability, they love patterns, um, numbers, puzzles. They're the ones that line up their matchbox cars one right after another perfectly and don't come along and mess that up because that'll, that'll. so they're a little bit OCD-ish, um, but they like predictability and they're, they're, they're really, um, they're, they're, my son, one of my sons is a metal type and he, he required very little um, um, correcting from me. He, he usually followed the rules and he didn't need a whole lot of discipline from me. He, he knew what he was supposed to be doing. And then finally, the water child is, um, they are called the philosophers. They're really deep thinkers. They're very yin. They're very, it goes with winter. They, they like to be by themselves. They, they are deep thinkers. They're always living in their, in their imaginary world. They're very creative and very imaginative. Um, and they don't like being around a lot of people. They're perfectly happy being alone in their rooms, writing or drawing or doing something creative. They do not need a lot of friends. And some parents can understand that. They think that their child is depressed. And I've worked with some mm. people like this. They think that their child is depressed. But it's just that they are, um, I mean, they could be depressed, but that's not a sign of being depressed. The fact that they like to be alone and doing their own thing in their own world. So they don't need people. They don't want people <laughs> or not one or two select friends. Um, and they also have a hard time with time with time maintenance. So if you are trying to rush your water child to get on the bus in the morning, it's going to be a challenge because they march to the beat of their own drum and to their own clock. So they're hard to uh, they're hard to get on a con um, conventional time schedule. So I don't know if that was a bit long, but those are, those are the five elements. No, thank you. I appreciate that because that is the core of your work and. Um, it's fascinating because every time you, you mentioned some traits, I was think, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. Oh yeah, that's my niece. Oh, that's my nephew. You know, I, I could picture individuals in these different mm -hmm. elements and how interesting that the ancients had these figured out a long time ago, Julie, when you think of it, because now we have so many other things that we use like Myers-Briggs and, um, you know, they have, uh, oh my gosh, there's human design. There's all kinds of things um, that, that break down character and the way that you work and the way that you see things in the world. But funny that they, you know, they, they had their own system and it's always been there. Um, but interesting yeah. that theirs are um, more associated with the earth and well, the elements, you know, which is, yeah. is really interesting. So no, I found that fascinating. So taking that knowledge, um, my next question is how do you blend the Eastern and Western ph philosophies in your work then? Um, you know, I, I, I was laughing when you said we shouldn't be calling people a, um, ADHD, a urinal children, but we should say, that's my wood child. And I'm thinking, I don't know if people get that, <laughs> you know, or that's my fire child. It's like, yeah, she's on fire. <laughs> but I mean, it would, it would be, it would be great. But, um, people might think, I think that lady's a little strange, <laughs> but so how do you blend exactly. these two together? Um, well, I guess I blend them together, first of all, in my head, because I'm bringing in the Western medicine, my experience and my, and my, all of the education that I had in it, blending it with what I am, I really practice the East, more Eastern medicine. So when I w work with parents, I understand exactly what they're saying when they're talking about various different diagnoses um, and from the Western perspective. So I understand, but I try to translate it into an, to an Eastern medicine approach because I just think that it's more comprehensive and more helpful and so I just I just take what the diagnoses are or what the assessments are from the Western medicine perspective and present it or tr translate it in my head and then to the parents into an Eastern medicine perspective and the thing about Eastern medicine is um, it's very useful and helpful to apply it the earlier, the better. So the other, the other modalities that you were talking about work for adults, and maybe they work for kids too. But this is just this is this is just made for kids. Um, there's several books on different kinds of ADHD based on the five elements: um, fire child, water child, and some other acupuncturists that have written about behavioral behavioral and physical health um, with children. So it's great that you can that we can start addressing 
potential problems um, and helping our kids at an early, earlier age to try to prevent them from going into <laughs> anxious, ill-prepared adults. <laughs> Yeah, and I could see that, that kids would resonate with this more. Um, but also, too, what you said is your element is your element. It never changes. Is is that what you said? Like, is that yeah. when you're young? You, that's, that, go ahead. That is your element. And some, as I said, there's sometimes there is a, um, a supporting element, a close second. And sometimes that may be more, may uh, um, show itself more, may may appear to be your dominant element in certain phases of life or certain stages, but your dominant element is your dominant element forever. It's just, it's what you're born with. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, people do change over time. So I was just curious about that. But like you said, you could have, you have a dominant element and then you could have, do you, can you have more than one sub elements or however you call it, whatever you would refer it to? I'm just interested um, in. Uh, there's really, uh, from what, from my understanding, um, there's the dominant, and then you may have a supporting. You don't really have more than one supporting element type. Mm. And as you change through life, um, and things do change, and people do change and grow and develop and mature or do what have you. But still, the core you, what you were born with as an as an element type, is there. It may be covered all up <laughs> and and changed okay. into different colors and and ways of being um, expressed but it is it's there at the core so yeah that makes sense to me like you, you it, it becomes covered up because you know they yeah. they were taught you know we were taught to conform to a certain way of being and don't we know that that's really a big problem <laughs> you know that's and yeah. they're trying to conform even more which is horrible but uh that's the subject for another day <laughs> for sure <laughs> so here's a, a topic that really hits home and we we spoke about it very briefly at the beginning technology and social media what do you mm -hmm. think of the roles of technology and social media in kids lives today and how does that come into play with your work um technology is a reality it's here it's not it doesn't have to be evil. I think that it does create problems. Um, but I think we need to learn to work with it. And actually, kids, I did have a conversation recently with somebody who was saying that kids really, with all their technology and all of their um, the stimulation coming at them from screens and phones and all this kind of stuff, they are, they're, they're really smart about it. They're really smart with it. And they can process things so much faster than us older people who are who did not grow up with technology. I mean, there was the generation of kids now who who were born with an, with an iPhone in their hands. The iPhone had been already um, invented. And so they are the iPhone generation, the I generation. So the technology, I don't think is inherently bad or a problem and is actually quite useful. I think that we just need to help our children understand how much is too much technology, what technology is appropriate, what is maybe not appropriate. I think the biggest problem with technology um, that I see is that kids are, adults too, but kids are so addicted to their devices that they no longer, many kids don't like to go outside. Mm. People, there's an epidemic going around where kids will you know, go outside and think, oh no, I wanna be back inside on my device and they don't like the fresh air or the sunshine or, and I think that that's a, that's a big problem. But I don't think that that's insurmountable. I think that it's up to the parents to have rules and limitations on the devices and enforce getting outside into nature and into fresh air. I think that that is really, I, I can't stress enough how important nature and time in nature is even if it's in the middle of a city going to the city park or looking at trees or something natural and getting away from the devices so um that's my thought on technology as far as social media um, i'm in the middle of an article in the atlantic about social media because i think mm. it's a big problem <laughs> um i think that it's uh, i think that social media is how kids are um, judge themselves are judged um, are bullied are intimidated, are made to feel badly about themselves. I mean, all this negativity comes from social media. It's a great way to connect. And I think it was helpful during the pandemic when kids were at home from school and didn't have other kids to um, communicate with or, or relate to. 
but in general, I think that social media is really quite damaging. And um, I don't know what the solution is, again, other than the parents putting putting limitations on. And, and parents, I think, should know where on the internet the kids are, what kind of social media they're engaged in and what they're doing on the social media. Um, be nosy, find out, <laughs> and, and just be aware of what your ch children are doing and decide whether you want to put a stop to it or not. But so, I, like I say, I don't have an answer for social media, but I think we need, it needs a lot of work. We need to be aware and we need to, we need to do something about it. So give us some examples then of how your approach has helped parents and kids. Um, just, can you just give us um, an example of, of what has shifted? Yeah, um, I alluded to it before. There's, um, I worked with a mother brought her child in, her daughter, who was probably about 14 at the time for headaches. Um, migraines. So I was treating her for migraines. And I talked with a mother about, so her the mother was concerned that she was depressed. And um, the child did, or I had a mother do the element, five element quiz for herself and for her child. And then I had her daughter do it for herself and for her mother. And the mother was absolutely a fire type, was really social, very busy, had lots of friends, was always off doing things. And the daughter was a water type. And they were, you know, they had a very close relationship. But I think that the daughter was misunderstood because she was a very, very talented artist. And the mother saw that and, and respected that. But the daughter liked to be, come home from school and be in her room doing her artwork and have, you know, one friend come over. And the mother thought that, that was a problem, thought that she was depressed. And the mother, um, tried to get her to go to the, the seventh grade or eighth grade dance that it was. And that didn't go over well at all. The daughter went to make the mother happy. And it was just a disaster because <laughs> um, it really should not have been. So with time, I think that the mother, I know that the mother understood that her child was not depressed, that she was a water type. And I talked to her a whole lot about water types are. And in fact, the psychologist that she took her daughter to confirmed that, no, your daughter is not depressed. <laughs> so that sort of confirmed what I was trying to tell the mother that she's fine. That's just the way she is and try to respect that and honor that. So that was one, one, one situation of when the mother had a, um, a better understanding. Parents certainly know their kids better than anybody else, but it just offers a different way to look at your child and a different kind of understanding of who your, what your child is all about, what, who they are and what they're all about. That's, that must have been quite the light bulb because it's yeah. interesting. It really, I mean, this is so insightful, Julie. I mean, because you, depending on how we were brought up, the parent, right? If, if, your if your child was that way inclined and, and, you know, wanted to keep to themselves and be in their room and you hear about it on the news and you think, you know, if your child is drawing into themselves, you know, be aware that that could be the signs. And isn't that interesting that, I mean, that, that could be signs, um, but if you understand these elements, it's more who they are, what their core um, essence is. And right. uh, like I said, it's it, and and what a relief I would think as a parent if I if I thought my child was depressed and she was going into a room because of that, it would be such a relief for me to understand to understand that it's not because of that. It's because that's who she is in her essence, and she is really by being alone. Um, she is is uh, that's her light by having right. her space. That's what produces her light. Um, yeah. yeah, that is just, that is beautiful. What a powerful story. Yeah, I, I would but I would also, think Jane, thank, thank you for bringing this up because it's also important. Yes, there are children who are depressed and they do need, yes. they do need help. And so there's other um, signs and symptoms of depression that parents should be aware of. Um, so it's helpful to know the element type, but thank you for bringing that up that you do want to, watch for signs of um, de depression. And there are certain telltale signs like a radical change in behavior or change in eating or various things. So. Right. No, absolutely. But uh, yeah, like you said, she had taken her to a psychologist. So she had done all the other work and they right. said that she wasn't. And of course, then as a parent, you would still be concerned because, you know, they could have misdiagnosis. I mean, that happens or whatever. So, 
but to have that peace of mind to say, oh, okay, now I understand, you know, I mean, right. I, th I think that's, that's, that, that's, it's such a wonderful service and it's such a wonderful insight that parents could have, you know, to have an understanding, to have a better understanding of, of who we are really of, as human beings. So that's really interesting. Yeah. I'd love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if a parent wants to go the holistic route, what is one of the first things that you recommend? I recommend that they um, become aware of themselves, what they're bringing to the table every, every time that they are um, interacting with a child, what they're bringing to the table. What are you saying? How are you saying it? Be mindful of one's own behavior. And then a very close second is to be mindful, and I call it consciously connecting with the child meaning um yes we connect certainly by hopping in the car and driving to the mall or hopping to the baseball game or whatever but consciously connecting taking time to really look at your child on their level developmentally and physically and really connect with them and listen to them um let them know that you're listening to them because all kids want to be heard they want to know that they matter and that they count and so I think that when we just the first step is being aware of where we're at as a parent and where our child is at as a child, not where we think they're at or where we want them to be at or where we think they should be at, where they are at and where they're coming from and connect with them and try to understand where they're coming from. Um, again, based on, on the five elements, but conscious, conscious connection. And that's, um, like I say, it's we connect with our kids a million times a day but it's not always conscious connection where you're really right. <laughs> conscious about what you're saying and, and what you're hearing. Yes. It, it takes some time and patience a lot of time. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's <laughs> the unfortunate. Yeah. That's, that's the thing with our lifestyle, you know, it's like, go, 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 go. And, uh, but yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm not sure if did you want, I have this question here, but I'm think you may have answered part of it. It says, what are three takeaways that you'd like parents to hear? Uh, is one of them to be aware and listen to your child, or was there some others that you wanted to add to that? So the modeling that we had, to, or setting the example and modeling um, is one. Consciously connecting certainly is one. Um, I also, as I write in my book, I have a chapter called Do No Harm, which means if if we did no harm to our kids, if we just that would be huge in a big way if we didn't um, humiliate them and embarrass them. And w without meaning to, we're often yelling at our kids and making them feel badly about themselves um, and, and demeaning them and, like I say, embarrassing them in public. And no child, that feels terrible to all kids to be um, reprimanded in public or embarrassed or humiliated or, you know, knocked down. So do no harm is one is another thing, which is really not that difficult just watch what you're saying and try to be you know try not to be so demeaning and not condescending i'm not that's not it but just yelling at them and scolding and just making them feel badly about themselves um i also think that if we redefine our term um, definitions of success when parents talk about well you know i want my child to go to this ivy league school i want them to succeed as a lawyer or a banker or whatever our definitions of success are, society does define success in a particular way that I don't think is always beneficial to all kids. So for a parent to redefine their um, definition of success and gear it more towards their individual child, what is their individual child meant to be doing in this world? And that takes time and patience and some, and some digging in, but it's much healthier for the baby, uh, for the baby, <laughs> for the child to, um, <laughs> to be, headed in the direction that they're meant to be um, directed in, not what society tells them is the, the status, the way to be in the world. And I think one last thing is that let your child, actually, I don't know how many th things I can say, but so uh, I would also say, let your child um, get out and play, free play without rules and without um, adult inter intervention, let kids get together and throw together a you know makeshift basketball game or a kickball game or whatever and let them do some free play don't have everything um 
organized and scheduled throughout the whole day. Let them just have some just downtime, free time to do whatever the heck they want. Preferably not on their devices, preferably outside in yeah. nature, but um, let them climb trees, let them run around and climb and tussle and do what kids naturally do, because that's what they do naturally do. And finally, I would tell parents to lighten up and relax and have fun with it all. Um, I would say laugh and play more and yell less and really enjoy the time as a parent with your kids because it's it's fleeting. It's um, the most important job in the world, I think, but it can also be one of the most fun, rewarding jobs that there is. Yes, absolutely. Boy, that that's great, great information, Julie, because we, we forget, um, and I say that often because as adults, we forget how important play is and it's so fun to see a new parent and the silliness that they do with their child you know <laughs> they're playing again it, it brings the child out in the adult you know they start making funny faces they start you know um pretending that they're whatever you know a ghost and it, it's it's just fun but and it's fun for the adult too so play is so yeah. important you know it really really is because let's face it i mean it's all about being happy and uh, just like you said, just let it go, be free, you know? So yeah. yeah, so important. I love those points. And we don't say it enough. We don't it remind our, even ourselves enough to get out and play and to have fun. Uh, you know, as adults, we get so rooted in what's happening because let's face it, there is a lot of static in the world today. Um, but like they say, life goes on and can we take those moments and of course we treasure them but make it make it so that it is uh just time for fun and free free for all <laughs> i love it yeah. that's that's great yeah. advice great great advice so tell us where parents and prospect pro, prospective parents can find you and learn more and and yeah, and i um, by the way i did want to mention your book is fabulous everyone at the back, you have an appendix where you can take the tests. And I think it'd be valuable not only for parents, but for adults as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm glad that you like the book. And you can find anything you want to about me, including my acupuncture, um, but my parenting coaching and where to get my book, which is on Amazon. So on my website is a link to the Amazon for the book. Um, and my website is juliephillipshatch.com. And again, that has parent coaching. It has all about me, my acupuncture, my book. Um, the five element quiz, I think, is probably on my website. And um, opportunity to sign up for a free 20-minute consultation with me to talk about you and your child, whatever whatever's going on, if you need some, I don't know if I want to say advice, but some insight, some some insight from me as, a, as an objective person. <laughs> Right. No, I would suggest take advantage of it and especially do the, 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 the breakdown, take the, the assessment. Um, because I'm going to do it myself because I'm really interested in finding, you know, my, my element as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I say I think it would be useful for even adults. Like you said, you did the mother and the daughter. Uh, so right. that's, that's great. So do go to her website and all that will be on um, our site as well. And tell us, what are you most excited about in life today? Oh, I'm always excited about kids. I just think that we all say the kids are the future and they are, but it was, is our opportunity to help shape the future and create the future through our kids. And I mean that not, um, <laughs> not directing our kids to do something that fulfills what we want to see happen, but to, but the, to, if we're raising you know, compassionate kids who um, come, are, come from the inside, are built from the inside out, um, that are less selfish, you know, more selfless, um, compassionate, giving kids, which is really their, um, the, which is the way kids are, younger kids are naturally anyways, they're loving, they're compassionate, they're caring, they, they don't like to see people suffer. If we can just keep them, keep them on that, still growing up and maturing, but still keeping those fundamental um, parts of themselves intact and bringing out to the world. So that's what I'm excited to see, because there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. 
And I just, I have faith in our, in our younger generations. I've got three boys who are now in their twenties, um, doing some great stuff. And I see lots of other younger generations. People will say, oh, you know, this younger generation, they're lazy and they're self-centered and blah, blah, blah. But I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think that the future generations are our future and can look bright. I, I'm really excited about them. <laughs> yes, absolutely, for sure. Um, and any last words you'd like to share with our audience? No, like I said, just um, for the parents out there, enjoy it. <laughs> Relax a little bit if you can. Don't take it quite so seriously, as serious as it is. Just try to take life a little bit less seriously. And like you said, play more. <laughs> Have a little bit more fun. Right. Goodness knows we need it. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, you know, like you said, the life, our life is, our, our world is serious enough. So, you know, we need mm -hmm. to take it and make it our own and, you know, continue with the uh the idea that uh there's still time for laughter there's still time for play and there's still time for you know just sitting down like you said and having some time with your your kids so because we're here on the epic vision zone julie i have one last question and that is if your life were an epic story what would the title be title of my life as an epic story the life and times of an adventurous uh, life and times of an adventurous, intrepid mother. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> I love it. That's it completes the entire picture. I love it. Well, th thank you so much again, Julie, for joining us. And be sure to check out Julie's website at juliephillipshatch.com and her book, A Parenting Revolution for Higher Evolution. And the appendix that at the back of the book that walks you through um, your child's elemental qualities and yourself as well. And you can find again, all of that information on the Epic Visions on bio pages. So you uh, can be sure to check it out there. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Jane Applegath and check out how you can become an epic entrepreneur at janeapplegath.com and get your free download, the keys to your dreams this is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success.